Welcome to the 255th of the COVID Calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. I'm coming to you live from Daejeon, South Korea. Today, my guest is historian of science and mathematics, Michael Barani. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID Calls live weekdays at 5.30 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID Calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID Calls. Please do help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and future topics please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, April 7th, 2021, there are 2,875,876 deaths from COVID-19 globally. That's according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. The death toll from COVID-19 in the United States has climbed to 556,529 lives lost. In Portugal, 16,887 have died of COVID-19, and in Iraq, the number is 14,535 dead from COVID-19. As a way to bring some humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic, and I'd like to continue that now. The headline is, it was just so unexpected. Family finds there's no mathematical formula to grieving loss. This appeared in NBC News, February 7th, 2021 by Ethan Sachs. As Michael Kleibaner watched his bride-to-be walk down the aisle in Puerto Rico during their wedding in 2004, he burst into tears. Kleibaner had a reputation for being analytical, especially at the science and math high school where he met both his future wife and the reporter of this obituary. And logic would dictate that he had seen Amy enough in the 13 years that they dated to maintain his composure. Only that large brain was often overshadowed by an even bigger heart. Mike was a huge sap, said Amy Kleibaner, his wife of nearly 17 years. He's the guy who would be crying over Hallmark card commercials. These days, however, it's everyone else's turn to cry. Kleibener died of complications from COVID-19 on April 14th, less than a month before he would have turned 48. What makes the loss more devastating for his family and friends is that he seemed to be recovering from a relatively manageable case of the virus at his home in New York City. Relieved not to need an emergency trip to a swamped hospital during the early weeks of the pandemic. And he collapsed in the bathroom of the apartment he shared with his wife and their nine-year-old daughter. He was brushing his teeth to get ready for his first walk outside in two weeks. He went into cardiac arrest as the paramedics were taking him down the stairs, the result of what would later be determined as a massive pulmonary embolism. They took him to the hospital, and I got a call about an hour later that he had passed away, Amy Kleibener said. It was just so unexpected. The loss was so sudden, so devastating, that it's only 10 months later that his family can speak about it. It's only now that this reporter could bring himself to ask the questions. His daughter, Sydney, who will turn 10 in June, likes to look at a photograph from her infancy in Shanghai in which she is propped up on her father's lap, one hand grasping for his bowl of noodles to steal his food, as she puts it. The picture reminds her of her dad's smile. He smiled a lot. My favorite moment with him is when we swam together because we would race and I would always win, but sometimes I would let him win, she said by email. In some ways, Mr. Kleibaner grew up a regular suburban kid on Staten Island, riding his bike, watching baseball, and collecting trading cards. Less typical were his elaborate science projects in middle school. One first place project that particularly stands out for his father, Edwin, was a study of how different wavelengths of light affect a mold that grows in horse manure. During summers, the Kleibaner family would pack up their car and head across the country for epic camping trips to national parks. And that's when Michael really seemed to be in his element. We were always at the back of the pack and Michael and his sister Alyssa were always at the front of the pack with the Rangers. And he was always asking questions, said Kleibaner's mother, Roberta. He always needed to know everything. 
So it was no surprise that Kleibaner ended up being accepted to Stuyvesant High School in Manhattan. Even at a magnet school that attracted so many other science and math prodigies, Kleibaner stood out as a student eager to learn more. We hung around in the math team circles, and I remember being impressed that he was teaching himself not theory, classmate John Ledwith said. The resulting project in that befuddling field of advanced mathematics earned him a finalist berth in the prestigious Westinghouse National Science Talent Search. In high school, Michael seemed to know everyone, including Amy, who at the time was just a friend of a friend. That changed once they bumped into each other again on the Staten Island Ferry the summer after they graduated. Their relationship also graduated. We just sort of saw each other as different people once we started getting a chance to know each other, Amy said. In 1994, Kleibaner graduated from Princeton University where he majored in applied mathematics and in which he kept a lifelong school pride. After graduation, Kleibaner began a career in finance before finding a niche consulting for dot-coms. A year after they were married, the couple moved to Shanghai. Kleibaner, who could start up a conversation with anybody on almost any topic, had made a good enough first impression with a guest at a friend's wedding to get a job offer at the reception. Two years later, he was hired by the Asia Pacific office of Jones Lang LaSalle, incorporated a real estate company where he rose to the head of research for Greater China. He was a natural coach and mentor to the staff, which is a strong quality, particularly in China, where at the time we had a very young local workforce who were eager to learn, said Kleibaner's boss for five years, Anthony Kaus, the CEO of the company's Asia Pacific office. Sydney, his daughter, was born in 2011 and the family moved to Hong Kong two years later. By the summer of 2019, Kleibaner was between jobs when he attended his 25th year college reunion. Being so close to their families made Kleibaner and his wife consider moving back, and they did so that August of 2019. While they were here, Kleibaner looked forward to passing on his own love of learning to his daughter. When we moved back to New York, we got family memberships to the zoos, the museums, and stuff like that, Amy said. And so we were really looking forward to taking advantage of all the cultural institutions here. They didn't get much of a chance before Michael got sick, and then everything changed. These days, his sister, Alyssa Geibel, comforts herself watching YouTube clips of the media interviews Kleibaner did in Shanghai and Hong Kong. Just to see him alive and well and doing his job brings tears of happiness, Geibel said. I'm like, oh, that's my brother. There's no mathematical formula, formula for how to handle the grief, even almost 10 months later. I often find myself bogged down with focusing on the loss, Amy said, and forget to remember the quirks that made Mike who he was. Okay, I'd like to turn to my conversation for today and been looking forward to this discussion with Michael Barani. Let me introduce him. Michael Barani is a historian of science and mathematics in the Science, Technology, and Innovation Studies subject group at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. He completed his 2016 PhD in the history of science at Princeton University and was a member of the Dartmouth College Society of Fellows. His current research focuses on the globalization of modern mathematics and on the social and material infrastructures, most notably the blackboard of abstract knowledge. Michael Barani, thanks so much for making time to come on COVID calls today. Thanks a lot, Scott. I've been really looking forward to this. So I'd like to start the way I usually do, just find out where you're calling in from, what the pandemic and vaccination situation is looking like there. Great. Um, so I've been working in Scotland and following the COVID pandemic um, that's going on there, um, but I've been uh, working remotely from uh, from Chicago, where my uh, where my wife works. We're still one of the common scenarios these days of a uh, long distance two body problem that the uh, really a silver lining of the pandemic has been. Um, the chance to be in the same place for a longer period of time. Um, in Scotland, uh, the pandemic is, uh, is affecting every aspect of life. There's a pretty uh, strict lockdown still. Um, it's been easing a little bit lately. I know a lot of colleagues have been um, sort of looking closely and anxiously about the prospect of schools reopening um, and how that affects um, uh, how that affects work life and uh, and other aspects of um, uh, of of um, yeah, a life in Scotland there. Um, in Chicago, my life has been pretty much the same for the last year. Uh, I've been um, in the apartment most of the day. I've been able to get outside for a little bit of sun um, now and again. Um, and I've had a 
really interesting secondhand view of the pandemic because my wife's work is at the uh, University of Chicago Hospital. She was involved in setting up their initial COVID ICU about a year ago. Um, so um, saw sort of firsthand how intense and stressful um, that was. Um, but, but from the perspective of an academic working, working remotely um, in a major city, it's been uh, a sort of quiet and, and yeah, weirdly isolated uh, sort of uh, year. I remember we had an exchange early on um, in that, it seems like 10 years ago now, looking yeah. back to the late spring. Um, and I, I remembered you sharing some of that about your, your wife. And um, I wonder, did she have to quarantine at home? Did you have to isolate it at home? Yeah, so we're in a one bedroom apartment in downtown Chicago. And so uh, keeping that isolation uh, in that context was pretty difficult. But yeah, we um, kept mostly apart within that context until we were pretty sure that the, um, the disinfection protocols were, were gonna be pretty reliable. Um, and yeah, that was a, a pretty tricky um, few weeks at least until we, fi well, we figured that out while she was working those, um, those shifts. I'm glad you're able to give us some perspective on on Scotland, and um, it's good to also get caught up on what's happening in Chicago. One thing about Scotland I'm always curious about is whether or not they had the same kind of discourse of criticism, um, their criticism of the national government of the UK. Um, I could try to follow it from a distance, but you probably know it quite well. I mean, what was that like? Yeah, so a striking aspect of the Scottish discourse is there's... Um, a, a lot more local trust in the sort of the national government of Scotland, um, as opposed to the, uh, I guess, the, the kingdom government of the UK, um, uh, the government in Westminster. So um, there's a huge amount of skepticism toward, um, toward the, uh, the Westminster Parliament uh, and uh, various approaches to the pandemic there. But one function of the devolved system of governance in the United Kingdom uh, is that a lot of the day-to-day -day aspects of crisis management, including the functioning of the National Health Service, uh, is down to the Scottish government, which has a, a much greater level of local trust and support. Um, it's the Scottish Nationalist Party, uh, uh, Nationalist Party in, in power right now, um, and with a pretty overwhelming um, um, public, uh, public majority that allows them to, um, to have a pretty firm hand um, with a lot of backing in setting restrictions. Um, they've had a much more cautious approach than England um, uh, for the pandemic. And it's really been reflected in a lot lower numbers uh, of, of infections and, um, and fatalities, um, although still you know, quite striking and serious by, by any sort of international measure or comparison. Mm. Well, I'd like to turn to talking about your work and the pandemic. And maybe we can start a little broadly. You can tell us a little bit about your research in the history and sociology of mathematics, and then we'll kind of follow that thread a little bit to understand the way that math and the pandemic have been intersecting throughout this last year. So tell us about your work. Absolutely. So uh, I come to this from a perspective of researching the global history of mathematics. Um, and I think the important thing to recognize and the kind of surprising thing about the global history of mathematics is we imagine this as a really universal subject that's always been everywhere. And in fact, uh, mathematics has been a global discipline only very recently, actually relatively recently compared to a lot of the other sciences. So unlike botany or geology or uh, you know, sort of the iconic sciences of empire, there's no real, real reason that a mathematician ever has to go beyond their backyard to, um, to find interlocutors, to find problems to work on, to find evidence or data for their research. Uh, so the kinds of things that have pushed mathematicians to form international networks and global connections um, have all been relatively recent, um, uh, relatively recent circumstances uh, and concerns and opportunities uh, connected to new international publication opportunities and infrastructures, new opportunities to build careers in different contexts, um, new ways of thinking about what the essential problems of mathematics were that motivated forming uh, international connections. Um, so math has really been a global subject in, um, in the way we appreciate today, only really since um, the decades after World War II, and for reasons having very much to do with the new kinds of um, migrations, refugees, uh, international movement um, that that war um, sparked or facilitated uh, or necessitated. Um, and I've been studying things like the International Congresses of Mathematicians, how these large, you know, multi-thousand person uh, meetings of mathematicians that we're now seeing in the new light 
um, facilitated new kinds of uh, imaginaries of, of what it meant to be a mathematician in a global community, what it meant to have a collaborator on a different continent from you, uh, which only really became a common phenomenon in mathematics after the 1950s, um, and how that changed the nature of mathematics. So how the, the different theories that we see in, uh, in mathematics from the 1950s, 1960s onward are a reflection of a new kind of international and global orientation in the discipline that, um, that emerges in, in that context. Um, and that work's connected to um, sociological and, cult and cultural studies of, of mathematics, about how mathematicians use um, blackboards, uh, databases, online technologies to interact, uh, and how these different media and infrastructures of mathematics produce different kinds of meanings and different kinds of possibilities for collaboration uh, among mathematicians. So go a little bit further with this discussion of blackboards, could you? Yeah, for sure. Um, so blackboards are this ubiquitous technology. They're also something that, that many people assume have been part of mathematics since time immemorial. Um, but we can actually trace quite specifically when blackboards became part of, uh, of research mathematics, um, which had to do with changes in engineering education in the early 19th century in France um, that spread rapidly throughout the world. Um, through these contexts of um, military and engineering education. Um, and blackboards became this sort of iconic site for, uh, for sharing and viewing um, a common sort of element of writing collectively in mathematics. And that sort of collective experience of, uh, of writing, writing that you could transcribe in your own notebook, that you could reproduce in front of the board for a professor, that approach to mathematics as based in writing uh, and based in a particular approach to sort of temporary, revisable, um, erasable, um, sort of a fixed in place kind of writing that produces a different kind of mathematics. And it's one that um, sort of famous studies of paper-based mathematics like Andy Warwick's uh, Masters of Theory um, mm -hmm. sort of uh, uh, showed in a different light for, for 19th century, giving rise to new 19th century sciences like uh, this really equation dense mathematical physics that became this iconic form of reasoning in the 19th century. Um, in the 20th century, um, blackboard mathematics became um, this sort of locus for um, for a research culture of mathematics that uh, was really built around um, the mathematical seminar, another technology of, uh, of or sort of another cultural technology that we assume has always been there, but um, but came to mathematics actually quite a bit later than many of the other sciences, decades after the physics seminars, uh, decades more after philology seminars and other kinds of seminars as a, as a genre or a format. Uh, for, for social exchange. Um, but the mathematics seminar um, gave rise to a culture of mathematics, as people like, like uh, historians like Anselm Green Palmier have shown, um, of, um, of mathematics as a process of reinterpreting other people's theories and that kind of mm -hmm. collective adoption and reinterpretation as a method of doing mathematics uh, really changed what kinds of mathematics people attempted to do and how they, um, how they performed it. Um, really with the rise of the mathematics seminar, the blackboard-based mathematics seminar um, from the 1920s and 1930s, but really taking off after World War II. That's, I mean, so fascinating. So, I mean, you're talking, you know, literally I'm picturing myself in front of my fourth grade math class, having to perform something on in front of a blackboard for my teacher and being unable to do it. But this is an innovation, a, a sort of a technological innovation of a sort um, that facilitated a new approach to mathematics um, and shared approaches to mathematics inquiry. But then as we get more into the possibility of digital um, interpretation of the Blackboard, how does that come about? Um, yeah, so, um, so, the, so the challenge is always how do, you, how do you tack between this very physical, immediate, tactile, immobile technology of the Blackboard um, and the means by which you can create a shared understanding at long distances, which are necessary for sustaining a global community. And what mathematicians have to learn, um, and it's one of the sort of hardest parts of their, um, of their graduate training and their professionalization, is how to convert between a research paper and uh, the kinds of comments and interactions and marks and inscription and revision that you make at a Blackboard. Um, so that process of translation from, um, you can think of kind of a, a for those who know, a, you know Bruno Latour and Immutable Mobiles, this kind of um, paper-based transit of symbols around the world, you have to and convert it into these kind of um, immobile but mutable forms of, uh, of writing that are um, the basis for mathematical creativity. Um, the thing that, you, the more time you spend on repetitions, the more you recognize that 
um, the kinds of mathematics that circulates in articles and books um, is just impossible to use as a sort of basis for, for creative thought. So hmm. mathematicians spend most of their time, this is an observation that goes back to you know, sociologists, uh, Martina Mertz and Karen Norsatina, um, spend most of their time trying to convert this kind of rigid, fixed, but portable mathematics into these more dynamic, unstable, um, what they call deconstructed uh, forms of mathematics that, that uh, allow for creative reinterpretation in the production of new mathematical theories. Uh, and the digital forms of that then you know, add this other dimension that, um, that have many of the aspects of um, the sort of portable feature of mathematics, um, but mm -hmm. allow for new kinds of more rapid back and forth interaction that take on some, but frustratingly for mathematicians, not all of the aspects of, um, uh, of, of the more fixed in place um, sort of physicalized blackboard mathematics. Wow. So, well, thank you for this background. So let's bring it into the pandemic a little bit. You know, yeah. You're talking about, um, you know, mathematicians like everybody um, suddenly find themselves restricted in terms of their travel. And we've talked with guests on COVID calls of what that's meant for field sites for everybody from, you know, people in biology to social sciences and humanities and anthropology. I was talking to a geologist yesterday, Mark Williams, um, who's at Leicester in the UK, and he was talking about all of his students and their various field sites from Vietnam to Indonesia and unable to do their work. So what has this meant for mathematicians then? Yeah, so um, a mathematician, famous mathematician, Paul Halmos once said that, that the, um, uh, the library is the laboratory of mathematics. Um, and indeed, mathematicians' access to the libraries has been uh, you know, one of the casualties of uh, of the pandemic, although many of math mathematicians' uh, sort of libraries these days exist in these virtual formats through the sharing mm -hmm. of papers on preprint servers um, like uh, archive.org, um, uh, electronic journals, electronic textbooks, uh, and mathematics actually since the 1980s has been at the leading edge of, um, of electronic distribution of library materials in a way that's transformed what it means for something to be part of a mathematics library. Um, but all the same, um, mathematicians have really felt the lack of access to their physical libraries. Uh, the corresponding, um, the corresponding change has been uh, that mathematics is a much more sort of embodied, interactive, collaborative discipline than most people assume. There's kind of the assumption that uh, of all of the disciplines, the pandemic should affect mathematics research the least. But if you look at trends in uh, in publication, in uploads to preprint servers. Um, uh, uh, an observation of um, Ed Dunn, who's the, um, the uh, director of mathematical reviews, this mathematical abstracting uh, enterprise run by the American Mathematical Society, has observed that um, there's basically no discernible difference between pre-pandemic and post-pandemic publication patterns in mathematics. So while laboratory hmm. scientists have been um, sort of stuck at home writing up all of their data, um, Mathematicians have actually been struggling to reproduce the kinds of settings of creativity and intellectual ferment that they rely upon to produce new ideas and new theorems um, uh, in, in, you know, in the context of their homes. Um, mathematics relies on a tremendous amount of just um, the ability to, um, to contemplate and reimagine and rethink, rethink things in areas where you're not sort of troubled by the outside world. That's obviously been deeply affected by the pandemic, but it also sure. relies on being put in situations where you have to explain your thinking to other people. Um, and those situations are just so much harder to create when mathematicians have been um, stuck mm -hmm. at home and they've been actually really creative in trying to find new ways to produce those kinds of uh, sort of approximations to the, the taken for granted situations in the departments where they have to take ideas and explain them and reformulate them and, uh, and um, to recreate them for other people as a way of producing new mathematical knowledge. Well, have you been privy to some of this adaptation? I mean, I, it's a, for a couple of things. First of all, you're educating me because um, I think we do have fixed in our mind this idea of mathematician, um, kind of like a philosopher, more like an extension of philosophy, a sort of solo genius off by themselves mm -hmm. with their blackboard. You're you're um, helping us understand that it's a much more um, uh, consensus oriented and communitarian kind of enterprise and bigger teams working on problems. So then as the adaptation online um, is working early in the pandemic, what are some of those forms look like and how do you, how did you access those or how were you, you know, as the analyst, um, the auditor of that, how were you able to participate? Yeah, so my main interaction with the mathematics research community is through math Twitter. Um, I'm a, quite, quite an active, uh, 
hmm. uh, active participant in some of those dialogues. Um, those are obviously not as directly connected to uh, the more intricate, you know, greater than 240 character or uh, 280 character um, uh, kinds of dialogues that mathematicians need at the, in the middle of their uh, the research and, and engaging with, um, uh, with research questions. Um, but what you can see, you know, refracted through through Math Twitter is all of the other ways that uh, mathematicians have been developing new settings for video conferencing, um, for sharing research in progress. Um, there's um, one very sort of uh, social media driven um, project called Talk Math with Your Friends, which is just meant to be an informal kind of coffee hour um, conversation um, in a non-threatening environment uh, for sharing new ideas and new research. Um, there, one of mathematicians' um, sort of early adaptations of the pandemic was uh, a clearinghouse called uh, MathSeminars.org, which they uh, later rebranded and incorporated more disciplines as ResearchSeminars.org, um, which was uh, a global directory of uh, of every single um, sort of pandemic shifted Zoom mathematics seminar in the world. So all of a sudden, you know, really for the first time, um, mathematicians basically, you know, at any hour of the day could find uh, or maybe with, if within any, any span of three or four hours could find a seminar taking place somewhere in the world on the research topic. Mm -hmm. And mathematicians are initially really thrilled to this super abundance of, uh, of people sharing research results um, that were connected to their field. Uh, Cause you know, often you have to go, you know, a week between attending a seminar, um, a seminar on your topic. Um, but I think mathematicians eventually started to appreciate more of the limitations of that um, that medium or that genre, um, the limitations on back channel conversations, the, um, the difficulty of asking, uh, awkward or naive questions in front of a worldwide audience of, um, right. of interlocutors. Um, and there are all these rituals of math seminars, like how you interrupt a speaker to get them to clarify a term that are just dramatically reconfigured in, in a zoom format. Um, mathematicians are among the most, um, sort of interrupting, dynamically interacting kinds of seminar audiences. It's very uncommon for mathematicians to come into a seminar with a whole talk prepared. Um, sorry. Uh, with a whole talk prepared um, uh, in advance. So often a mathematician will come in with just a page or two of notes, some definitions written out, uh, a sketch of how they're going to prove the theorem. And the way the seminar goes is as, is as a dialogue between the mathematician and the audience. That's a much harder format to sustain in uh, in a Zoom conversation without the ability to write dynamically on a blackboard, without the ability to modify definitions, to challenge notations, to explore side cases. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something I don't think mathematicians really have figured out how to uh, how to replicate in, in the Zoom environment, much to, uh, again, much to many mathematicians' frustrations. Just a reminder, you're listening to COVID Calls. I'm talking about mathematics in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic with my guest, Michael Barani. And let's talk a little bit about um, sort of some of the issues within math. We've been talking a little bit about how mathematics research is getting done. Um, maybe we can say a little bit more about that. Um, you shared with me one case that's been on your radar. Um, this is the story of Shinichi Mochizuki and the ABC conjecture, which has caused some bit of problem um, in terms of, you know, inability of people to be with each other at this time during the pandemic. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so this is a problem that dates to a couple of years before the pandemic, but I think the pandemic has really changed what this means to the world of mathematics. Uh, so um, the ABC conjecture is a famous conjecture in mathematics. Uh, it's one of the major open problems that a number of different uh, sources have identified as, you know, the kind of uh, fame making, you know, legacy making, um, open problems of, uh, of mathematics. Um, it has to do with the relationship between, um, between the factors, um, uh, of numbers and how they scale, uh, in, uh, as the, as the numbers themselves grow. Um, it's, uh, and it's, uh, uh, a problem that, that is considered to, to take, you know, a dramatic new kind of mathematics or new approaches to mathematics in order to resolve in, in number theory. Mochizuki came forward uh, a few years ago with with a claim that he had developed just such uh, a mathematics. He called it uh, interuniversal Teichmuller theory, um, and it had this sort of very elaborate new notation, um, this intricate new apparatus. And uh, when someone comes forward, especially someone with an established repu uh, reputation, uh, a, a major position in in the mathematics discipline, like Mochizuki has and had. Um, 
there's then uh, a kind of convergence of leading mathematicians in, in the field all the world over to try to understand the claim proof, to try to make sense of it, to see whether it really holds water. Um, and mathematicians um, started to do this after Mochizuki announced his proof. Um, and basically what the mathematics community sort of came to, uh, came to find early on uh, was that it was basically impossible to understand this theory and this framework and this approach to proving, uh, to proving the conjecture um, unless you were in sort of very intimate, close, sustained contact with Mochizuki, unless you had basically years to develop a detailed appreciation of the ins and outs of this theory. So then the question is, um, does that mean this theory is is you know really difficult and necessary and profound, and you just need to put in the years to understand it, or does it mean there are fundamental flaws to the theory that um, uh, that you basically have to learn to ignore over the course of years, or learn to look past, um, but that the mathematical community, as it comes together to try to understand the theory, um, can recognize? And so there's these sort of basic questions about mathematical epistemology and collective understanding, and the criticism of Mochizuki, um, you know, dating back to um, to the initial announcement of the proof is that it, uh, an expectation in the mathematics community, if you come forward with a major new proof, is that you should be willing to travel the world to explain it to people, um, to go to their seminars, to get in front of their blackboards and talk through the details and the difficulties and um, the special cases and the, the, you know, the different considerations of the theory. And Mochizuki just refused to do that. Um, and, mm -hmm. and so there, was, there's, there were attempts to try to figure out the theory independent of him, and they all, always ended up with a roadblock of, um, you know, if only we had someone who really felt they understood the theory here, that we could just ask these questions rather than trying to figure it out and run into these, um, these struggles ourselves. Um, so obviously, one thing the pandemic you know, makes us ask is, are we now living in a world where that expectation that a mathematician should travel the world, that, uh, that the world's experts on a particular topic should be able to come together and hash it out in front of a blackboard to determine whether a new theory is valid? Is that a reasonable expectation for the future of mathematics? Is, this, you know, is our deep, difficult, challenging new theories um, possible or imaginable or sustainable in a world where mathematicians aren't able to travel at the drop of the hat to um, to form those kinds of in-person interactions that are the basis for uh, this really technically and socially and infrastructurally intensive process of making mutual understanding in mathematics. So the ABC conjecture has to sit and wait a little bit then until people can travel to Moshizuki's uh, you know, office and, and sit down and spend this time with him or is there a workaround for this? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it would seem so. So, so in fact, I mean, the, there's this assumption, right, that once uh, you know a mathematical result is written up and passed through a peer review process and published in a journal, that that at least should settle it. But um, that's happened with the ABC conjecture. Um, the uh, Moshizuki's papers have um, you know have received some form of peer review. They were published in a journal that for which Moshizuki is editor in chief. So there's some controversy about uh, whether, uh, even though he was formally recused from that whole editorial process, whether um, that was a reliable process, but a, a fundamental sort of upshot of the challenges mathematicians have had in comprehending and validating this proof is that now mathematicians don't believe the published articles uh, in general. I mean, you see the majority of mathematicians um, don't believe that this extensive series of publications in um, uh, in, in Mochizuki's journal uh, do amount to a proof of, of the ABC conjecture. Um, shortly before the pandemic, uh, a, a pair of European mathematicians actually traveled to Kyoto um, to try to have this kind of in-person exchange. Um, and they got up to the point where they thought they had detected a fundamental error in the proof. And so they went back to their home institutions and wrote this up. And then Mochizuki said, well, you clearly didn't understand. And it was quite a nasty uh, uh, response. Like, you know, this is basically any undergraduate would not make this error um, using some sense that no undergraduate knows. Um, but, uh, you know, just basically, it, you know, it, it resolved down to this kind of, you know, prover's regress of, um, you know, was it a question uh, that these mm -hmm. two mathematicians really just needed more immersion and more time in the Mochizuki orbit in order to come to an understanding of this? Um, uh, or, or, you know, are we facing the limitations of, of what that kind of uh, exchange and interaction can, can yield? Let's talk about some of the other ways that mathematics um, concepts have been sort of brought to bear on the pandemic. I'm thinking, you know, kind of earlier on in the pandemic, just as people were trying to get their minds around, reporters trying to get their minds around what we should expect to see with the numbers. 
And there were some interesting articles written um, in February and March of last year about um, sort of problems that people have comprehending the concept of exponential growth, mm -hmm. um, which is also a problem for understanding climate change yeah. uh, as well. And so I'm sort of curious about that. And I guess more generally, the omnipresence of, of data, of uh, quantitative data, data visualization, you know, we've been flooded with numbers in this last year. And I, I think, um, you know, even people who are very highly sophisticated in that area have been arguing about the way that that data is represented, the way those numbers are represented, the different spheres within which those disputations can take place while a pandemic is unfolding. So I'm sort of curious what you've been keeping your eye on um, as mathematics sort of engages with the day-to-day -day fear and concern of the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so one thing that the, um, the kind of quantitative data-driven side of the pandemic has really uh, brought out for me is um, there's a kind of distinction within the mathematics, uh, within the mathematics profession of a, some, sometimes radically different just kinds of mathematician or approaches to kinds of mathematical knowledge even that the mathematics profession produces that I think is not really visible um, from outside the mathematics community, except in these situations where um, one side or the other of the community is really brought to the fore in uh, certain kinds of public understanding, um, at, sometimes at the, the expense or the exclusion of the other. So um, there are large areas of the mathematics profession uh, where numbers just don't exist. Uh, you know, symbols exist, um, you know, uh, equations and syllogisms and transformations exist, um, but actual sort of numbers of things that derive from counting stuff up or measuring things or manipulating things um, are just uh, really not part of the, ma the abstractions that mathematicians um, produce and use and debate and develop sophisticated ways of reasoning about. Um, there are whole other areas of the mathematics profession where numbers are everything, where uh, manipulating and nuancing and interrogating and um, modeling and reconfiguring numbers are uh, are the focus of um, yeah these these uh, this sort of other world of of elaborate theories and methods and techniques. Um, and these are the kinds of mathematicians who are contributing to you know, that famous uh, model from, from Imperial College uh, that was predicting the, the two plus million deaths early in the pandemic that was used as a source of public debate or public reasoning. Mm -hmm. um, and that disconnect between those two different aspects of the mathematics community really comes through, um, through quite clearly. But uh, I think maybe another aspect of that is in mentioning the exponential, exponential growth and the problems of grappling with that. One thing that's common to both of those mathematics communities is that mathematicians have a particular um, interest in and way of um, way of approaching how to make unintuitive things feel like the most natural intuitive things in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I think a, 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 a common theme in um, in a lot of mathematical training and mathematics education and mathematics research is. Um, is developing these sort of formal ways of reasoning your way from sort of intuitive, natural seeming starting points to understandings of phenomena that if you just stated them at the front would seem completely implausible or unjustifiable or uh, irrational. And there, there are aspects about you know, exponential growth that really fit this model. I mean, there, if you just sort of describe the consequences of exponential growth in, in lay terms, um, you know, the fact that you know, by the time you can see an exponential growth, something growing exponentially, uh, it's probably too late to to stop it right. from growing. Um, the the way that exponential growth interacts with time, time and space, those things are completely unintuitive. And the idea that it should be possible to reason about them uh, rigorously in a social context, um, that idea is like one of one of the god tricks of mathematics. The the um, and sort of developing this 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 capacity to believe to to see things as intuitive that are radically unintuitive, um, for for better or worse. Wow, that's 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 really interesting. I, let's, let's talk a little bit more about the, the cultural power of mathematics in this time. Uh, for example, I don't know if people were tracking this over the the summer, but this two plus two equals five discourse. Maybe you can remind us a little bit of what that was was about. Yeah. So so this this started in. Um, well, it had a number of starting points, but but it, it's uh, it sort of came came to public attention over the summer in discussions of racism in math education and um, the sort of the politics of 
um, of public numeracy and um, public epidemiology and debates about you know, what numbers come from and what calculations mean. Um, and in the context that um, a number of mathematics educa educators, particularly uh, women, uh, women of color, um, uh, we were discussing you know, you know, basic aspects of you know, how, how mathematics education is, is often based on quite, uh, quite racist assumptions and frameworks and models uh, and the need to uh, understand social context uh, and um, uh, social context and the, the context of racism and uh, social inequality in teaching things as seemingly simple as, uh, as arithmetic multiplication um, reasoning with numbers. Um, there was a huge backlash to this, um, you know, promoted by, by certain sort of professional trolls on, uh, on social media um, that returns to this idea of, um, uh, you know, that, that there are, some, there are some, some facts of math that not even, you know, not even anti-racist can challenge, that two plus two equals four. Um, and this idea that, the, that there are sort of incontrovertible ground truths of mathematics um, that anyone who wants to reform uh, reform mathematics education or address racism in mathematics must you know must believe that uh, two plus two is up for debate. Um, that came to a head in a really interesting way in the summer with uh, a number of mathematicians, statisticians, uh, epidemiologists um, actually engaging with this question of like what would it mean for two plus two to equal five? It's actually not as unreasonable to contemplate as as you might think. Um, this is a question with a long history in um, in the philosophy of mathematics. Uh, Imre Lakatos famously. Um, you know, contemplated scenarios where two plus two could equal five or six or any of a number of things uh, and what that would mean for mathematics and how it makes us under understand the philosophy and sociology and epistemology of mathematics differently. Um, but in the context of, uh, of this public debate, it really became a, a, a touch point of, um, uh, or a sort of, sort of common um, place for situating this question of what, where does the the pliability or the reinterpretability, reinterpretability and the social contextualization of mathematics stop? Where does it matter? Where do numbers gain their sort of social force uh, and, mm. and ability to change change debates? I mean, it's so interesting because that's, you know, the context here, of course, is the, uh, the broader you know, discussion about George Floyd and Black Lives Matter and um, concept of, of structural racism and I'm sort of, you know, this discussion that you're, um, that you pointed me to, and I went back and uh, I, it had registered with me at the time, but I went back and looked at it and I had forgotten how, how really acrimonious it, it yeah. had gotten and how much it tapped into similar kinds of um, pushback. You know, we were being shown what the, the pandemic was showing us structural racism in America, but it was also showing us sort of structures of privilege and things that must not be questioned. Like for example, the United States history begins in 1776. Well, mm -hmm. maybe it starts in 1619 or even before. And let's talk about what sort of, you know, the social power of dates in that case yeah. does. And you're talking about, well, what does the social power of numbers do? And so obviously two plus two equals four. Well, the minute you try to bring that into a broader sort of social context about the history of mathematics or the history of that kind of reasoning, you run up against the wall of um, of the sort of inherited power um, mm -hmm. of being able to adjudicate those kinds of problems, and you've well, looked this, at the deeper yeah. history of that. Well, this ties to what we were just talking about about the you know the exponential curve, right? The, the obviousness right. of two plus two equals four is itself a historical phenomenon that's relatively recent. Um, the it, the uh, and, and specifically, it's, it's a 19th century phenomenon. The idea that two plus two should obviously equal to, be equal to four and that the ability to recognize the, um, this conversion between two plus two and four uh, and its you know, obviousness universality, that became a kind of marker of a particular kind of colonial European white supremacy in the second half of the 19th century. Um, and as related to this, um, uh, this famous travel log from um, from Francis Galton, founder of eugenics uh, and um, and modern statistics, and many you know, sort of other uh, sort of famous um, uh, famous interventions. Um, and Galton, before he gets into statistics, before he gets into eugenics, um, he starts his career as uh, as a traveler. And one of the ways on his travels and his, his account of his journey that he uh, sort of establishes the um, I guess the superiority of uh, of uh, of European reasoning, the the sort of 
utter savagery of the African mind is by telling the story of a um, uh, of a tribesperson who he tries to trade with who doesn't accept a trade that he offers. Um, and Galton's interpretation of this um, refusal to accept um, accept this trade. Uh, his interpretation is that um, this tribes person uh, didn't understand that two plus two equals four. Um, there are lots of other ways to interpret this uh, to interpret this refusal, a lot more plausible ways in my view. Um, but Galton's interpretation is the one that um, becomes re um, sort of recycled over and over again uh, in the 1860s and the 1870s and the 1880s in debates about the differences in human intelligence, the evolution of civilization, um, the nature of the savage mind. Um, and, and even things like the nature of animal intelligence. People are comparing um, Galton's so-called African savages to, um, to crows and dogs and, um, and small children. Uh, and so it becomes uh, this question of the obviousness of two plus two becomes a way of ranking and rating and comparing and infantilizing and animalizing uh, uh, other, other races for, for this certain tradition of um, of European, of white European uh, prehistory and colonialism and anthropology. And so that historical, um, you know, case that you're talking about, it, it lands on us like everything else in the middle of this pandemic in the summer of 2020. I just want to remind folks you're listening to COVID calls. I'm talking to Michael Barani about mathematics and the pandemic. Um, maybe uh, I don't know if this is in your in your wheelhouse, but I did want to ask you about it. You know, a lot of the discourse about returning to school, uh, and you know, so we've been talking about mathematicians and their need to get together um, and do the work that that they do. Um, but what you know, also school children, and a big driver in that has been. I haven't heard much that. Um, you know, kids are going to lose out on a year of history education. What that, what's that going to mean for democracy? I've heard a lot more about what's going to mean for kids to lose a year of their STEM, and particularly mathematics education. I wonder if you've been tracking that discourse as well, because as we know, some of that discourse has gotten weaponized to paint teachers or school administrators um, as not sufficiently committed to ch children's learning when in fact they were trying to care for their own families or protect themselves in the absence of safety protocols in the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as, as you note, uh, the, uh, the, this question of, you know, are, what is the cost of students missing math class? Um, that's tied into uh, to decades, generations of, uh, of mathematics and its role as a kind of social sorter, as a way of, uh, of ranking and um, measuring and marking students as this sort of a uh, veneer of objectivity in how we differentiate and treat and uh, and discriminate among different student populations and student groups. Um, the way we evaluate students and compare them, you know, international mathematics exams, uh, the, the PISA, this famous, this uh, sort of iconic way of, um, uh, of of ranking different national mathematics systems. This is all connected to, um, you know, really in many ways, this this post World War II um, mentality of mathematics. Um, as the sort of source, and it has some sort of pre-World War II um, origins as well, but as the source of, uh, of intellectual and technological and scientific capacity for, um, for a nation. Um, and the idea that uh, a mathematically trained workforce, uh, mathematically and technologically trained uh, workforce and, uh, needs to you know, meet certain milestones, have certain capabilities, um, have certain capacities on a certain strict timeline, um, that idea has been foundational to um, to ideas about how the uh, American and, and other nations' economies are connected to their education systems um, for for decades and decades. And uh, and in this context, the um, sort of anxiety over um, uh, over you know uh, gaps or deficits in mathematics education um, is often a way of giving this sort of veneer of objectivity, of universality, to anxieties about, um, about um, racial inequality, about our abilities to sort people and to sort of objectively rank and compare people um, and, uh, and track students uh, and, and move them along these educational systems um, and are often ways of um, sort of grappling with or putting in different terms 
uh, concerns about um, what we have long known to be sort of fundamental inequalities in the kinds of support students get at home, um, the adequacy of schools with different class sizes and different resources to support students in different ways. Um, so, so mathematics once again becomes this this way of uh, becomes this way of naturalizing um, or making making intuitive, making obvious um, these highly sort of socially contingent uh, relationships mm. uh, and inequalities and uh, and social assumptions. Um, connected to the purpose of education. Yeah. That's such a powerful insight, Michael. I mean, I wonder how hopeful you are that, you know, as we go um, into the next school year, and it will become obvious that students who normally experience great privilege maybe shouldn't be evaluated the way we have traditionally evaluated them because of the uncertainties of education, in this case, math education over the last year, that that could provoke a sort of broader discussion about some of these sort of seemingly usually treated as obvious things like, you know, uh, math literacy is is the way you measure an economy, it's the way you measure a, a country. Somehow that moves through history outside of class and race in history. So um, and those are flawed assumptions, I think. So I wonder how hopeful you are, maybe hopeful is the wrong word, but I wonder what you'll be watching for as sort of signs that that discourse is, is active, that we can challenge that a little bit this moment, because there could be a lot of students you ordinarily would be saying, yeah, they're they're headed, they're Ivy League bound. Um, their the evaluation of their last year in school is going to need to be much more subjective. Yeah, I mean, I guess following and sort of picking up from from mathematics educators that 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 I follow and interact with, I think I'm at once cautiously hopeful that. Um, that this will be an opportunity to reconsider what is necessary and what is important in mathematics education uh, and the mathematics curriculum to see, um, you know, are are we making authentic connections between um, between how mathematics education and how mathematical understanding really does have the power to reshape how people, how students, how citizens engage with the world and engage with their societies, and can this be an opportunity to rethink what what connections and meanings are most important and most valuable? I also share this anxiety with um, with a lot of mathematic, mathematics educators that this will be uh, that this pandemic and the, the circumstances that, that we've been seeing are uh, are going to end up as uh, as a moment for for retrenching our reliance mm. on mathematics and quantification and sorting, um, and that this will further naturalize the privilege of people who are in households mm. where they get you know support at home for. Uh, for developing their numeracy, for practicing arithmetic, um, and that those kinds of inequalities will uh, will just be reinforced by um, by the reliance on these generally hidden forms of uh, of sort of social and pedagogical infrastructure. The argument will be, well, the only way to really take the temperature um, of what happened to students last year will be to revert to even more supposedly objective um, sort of hard evaluations um, and mathematics will be one of those areas, certainly. Yeah, when standardized tests come back, they're going to show that some students have made great strides in their mathematics and some students have not. And are those students right. then going to be deprived of arts education? Are they going to be um, tracked into different math classes? I mean, this is something we've seen, you know, even without a pandemic, happens all the time in education. Well, we're up on time. i uh, really enjoyed this conversation with Michael Barani and just want to remind everybody that you've been listening to COVID Calls. Um, today is a special uh, day. So this is a program note on COVID Calls. Once I finish this conversation with Michael, um, stay tuned. I'll be joining um, two guests for a second special episode. This will be a return to Cancer Alley discussion with Wesley James and Kimberly Terrell. So please do join me. Um, for that, starting in a few minutes, starting at 6.30 Eastern time. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for this really illuminating discussion today. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Scott. It was a real pleasure to talk with you. Stay healthy, everybody. And we'll see you in just a few minutes for a following episode of COVID Calls.